Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. A much brighter day than yesterday. And so uh, we come and echo those words that we just sang. Speak, O Lord, until your church is built and the earth is filled with your glory. So as we desire to hear God speak this morning, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to uh, Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and we'll be going from verse 27 until the end of the chapter, 27 through 39. Luke chapter 5, verses 27 through 39. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at the story of the healing of the, the paralytic, and when we did so, we entered into a small section of Luke where we enter into controversy. We come in to, uh, to understand these, this group called the Pharisees, and the Pharisees immediately show up, and when the Pharisees show up, controversy comes with them. And they first have controversy about Jesus if he's truly able to say your sins are forgiven. They say it's blasphemous because they don't understand that Jesus is God. Today we'll look at controversy over who Jesus eats with and controversy over fasting. And then next week, uh, Ken will, will show us controversy over the Sabbath. And so we're in this area where we're engulfed in this controversy that surrounds Jesus because Jesus is coming and at, or Jesus has come. And when he came in his incarnation, he changed everything. And when you change things, if you've been around church long enough, when you change things, controversy arises. <laughs> and in fact, we'll see some of that today as it goes beyond mere carpet color, but to some of the greatest uh, traditions of the, of the religion. And Christ messes with those traditions. He messes, if you will, with those sacred cows. And when you mess with those things controversy comes. But Christ messed with those things because he had a specific me uh, purpose. And his purpose was to come to save the sinner. Not to uphold all the religious traditions of the day, but to save the sinner. I want to show that to you today as we look through uh, Luke chapter 5, 27 through 39. So if you'll read with me says, After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers, and so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, Can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new, and the piece from the, the new will not match the old. And so... And no one puts new wine into old wide skins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says, the old is good. So we come to this section where we see Jesus lays out this mission once more, this mission that he has come to call sinners 
to repentance. It's, it's now the second or third time in Luke that we've, we've seen a group who's trying to distract Jesus from his mission. We've, we've seen Satan himself come and try to distract Jesus from his mission. But we've also seen well-meaning people like in Luke 4 where they say, Jesus, why don't you just stay with us? Your ministry's going well here. And Jesus says, no, my, my mission is to go and to preach to all the villages. My mission is to go and make the gospel known to all the villages because the Son of Man comes seeking the lost. Right? He's come to save the sinner. And so he, he comes now uh, to this part and it says, After this, following the, this miraculous healing of the paralytic man, he goes out and he sees a tax collector named Levi. Now we know Levi. Levi is the one who we call Matthew, who writes the Gospel of Matthew. This is how Levi becomes a disciple of Jesus. He's sitting there in his tax booth. Because he's a tax collector. This fits so well with Jesus coming and saying, I have come to call, not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. When we, when we see the call of Levi, we see the call of a sinner. And, it, and it's made really clear by the fact not only that the Pharisees later just keep pointing out that he's a sinner, but by the fact that he's a tax collector. Now, all through the ages, there's, there's been very few uh, occupations that have remained constantly despised. But one of those is tax collectors, right? No matter what time frame you find yourself in, you'll find yourself not liking the tax collectors, the, the people who, who take your money. But in this day and time, I want you to realize that when I say tax collector, I'm not so much talking about the IRS as I probably am more like the mafia. More like a, a, a person who would shake you down. He could, he could stop you at any moment he wanted to and demand money from you at that time. He not only took what the Roman government told him to took, take, he took a little bit extra to line his pockets. They were despised. They were, they were placed in authority by the Roman officials and they used their authority in order to make themselves rich. And they did so at the expense of the people. And Luke has already pointed that out to us when the, when the tax collectors come to John the Baptist. What does he say to them? Stop extorting other people, right? And so we, we've already seen that he says, if you want to follow after, if you want to be a part of this righteousness, stop extorting. Stop taking more money. Stop taking advantage of these people. But Luke himself is a tax collector. And Jesus is walking. And what I want you to see here is Levi, uh, not Luke, I'm sorry, Levi himself is a tax collector. And what I want you to see here is Levi doesn't come seeking after Jesus. Jesus comes seeking after Levi. Why? Because that's his mission. That's what he's come to do. He's come to call the sinner to repentance. And if ever you needed a picture of a sinner, you have the tax collector. And so Jesus leaves this miraculous healing where he demonstrates that he has the power to heal not only the body, but to forgive sins. And as he walks away from there, he just so happens to pass a tax collector sitting at his tax booth. Or more so, he walked that direction because he knew exactly what was going to happen. And he walks up to him, and, and that's just not something you do. Most of the time, you, you see a tax collector coming down this side of the road, you switch to the other side of the road. You avoid the tax collector at all costs. You remember you forgot something back home, and you turn around, and you go quickly in the opposite direction. You don't want to go to the tax collector. The tax collector finds you, but in this case, Jesus finds the tax collector. And he walks up to him and he says, follow me. Not a question, but a command. Follow me. And the Bible says in verse 28, and leaving everything, 
he rose and followed him. Now, the first thing I want to point out to you is not the everything. We'll get to that in a minute. The first thing I want you to see is that it says he rose and followed him. Luke is making a connection between what just happened with uh, Levi and what took place with the paralytic. In the same way that when Jesus says that you may know your sins are forgiven, rise, take up your mat and go home. Now, in this case, when Jesus says, follow me, Luke or Levi rises. I don't know how often I'm going to confuse Luke and Levi, but it's going to happen, I think. But they, they, he rises up. It's this picture that shows us that the same power that was able to heal the paralytic man is the power that's able to heal the soul. It's not just a physical healing that Jesus has come to do, but it is a spiritual healing. And he, he says to Levi, get up, rise, follow me. And just the same way that the paralytic rises up, takes his mat and goes home, Levi will now rise up, follow Jesus and take Jesus to his house. And we have this, this correlation that Luke is giving us to show us that Jesus has this power. To show us that when, when Jesus says to Levi, follow me, he's not just talking about physically walking with him. He's making a change in Levi's life. Everything is changing for Levi when he stands up in obedience to Christ. It's this call of a disciple. And this call of a disciple means forsaking everything for Christ. We saw that with the first call of the disciples. They left their father in their boats and the nets. And they came with Jesus. We see that here where Levi apparently doesn't put in a two-week notice. He just stands up and walks off. And he leaves everything. We'll see it again in Luke chapter 14. When it tells us that unless you take up your cross and die to yourself daily, unless you forsake your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, yes, even your own life, you're not worthy to be called a disciple of Jesus Christ. We see the cost of discipleship here. Jesus calls the sinner to follow him. And part of that call of obedience is forsaking everything for Christ. Now, obviously, that looks a little bit different and may not literally mean everything in the terms of giving up everything. It looks a little different. We know because when the disciples who were fishermen left their nets and their boats and their fathers, did that mean they would never ever fish again? No, in fact, we see them fishing later. They go back to fishing. But when Levi leaves this tax booth, there's no going back. It's a different kind of, of commitment for him there. When Levi leaves everything, does that mean he, he gave up all his money and all of his possessions? No, it doesn't. And we know it doesn't because the very next verse tells us that he took him to his house and prepared a great, a great banquet for him. This leaving everything, this forsaking all else for Christ is the idea that nothing, nothing matters more to you than Christ. That whatever comes between you and Christ, you forsake, you get rid of. This is the problem that the rich young man had. He couldn't do it. When it came to, to following the laws, when it came to being moral, when it came to, to doing all the things that seemed right, he was happy to do those things. But when it came to giving up his possessions, he couldn't, he couldn't forsake those for Christ. For many of us in this room, this, this may be a, a real personal struggle right now. When it comes to coming to church, when it comes to following all the, the moral laws, we don't cuss, we don't drink, we don't chew, we don't date people who do. When we, when we do all those kind of things, we may be able to say, I'm all in. But when it says, hey, I want you to give up your time. I want you to give up your resources. I want you to give up your, your habit. 
Say, well, hold on. Let's back that up. If we were to take that into a, a modern day American view, we might say, uh, I want you to, to give up your commitment to the athletic event that's going to take over your time with church. And we would say, well, I think you're being a little legalistic. But here, Jesus says, follow me. Let me ask you, dear Christian, I'm under the assumption that most in this room have already taken up the, the call to follow Jesus. What would you forsake to follow Christ? Or better yet, let me ask it this way. What have you not forsaken to follow Christ? He follows Christ. He rises. It's, a, it's an immediate thing. I love it. It's not a, let me think about it and I'll get back to you. He, he rises up and he follows Christ. And when he does, everything changes for him. How much does everything change? Well, well look again at verse 29. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. Levi goes and throws a party, a great banquet. It's the first time we see a great banquet in Luke, but it won't be the last time we see a great banquet mentioned in Luke. And as he throws this great banquet, guess who's invited? Who's invited are all the people that Levi knows. And all the people that Levi knows are, are all the wrong people. Again, tax collectors were not popular men. <laughs> they didn't, everybody was not clamoring to hang out with tax collectors. No one liked them. The only other people he knew were pretty much tax collectors. And so you have all these tax collectors and, and those of that ilk who are there with them. And then Jesus and his disciples. But notice the, the purpose of this banquet. It's to honor Jesus. He says there in, in 29, and Levi made him a great banquet. He, he throws this great banquet because in the Middle East especially, especially during these times, but even true in our time, when you eat with someone, there is a bond and a friendship, a fellowship that happens. But in their time especially, to sit at the table, to recline with someone, to have dinner with someone, meant that you were, you were crossing all the social lines and you were now bonded together. You were exchanging your, your friendship one with one another. And this is why Jesus is often accused of being friends with sinners because he's he's eating with them and we'll see in a minute this is a big no-no right this is you don't do this but but Le Levi he doesn't know that because he's he's just decided to follow Jesus and and Levi says hey look I know this guy named Jesus and he's changing everything and you've got to know him and so Levi uses this feast to bring all of his friends together so that they can also know about this Jesus. You know, that's still a, a great practice today. Figure out how, how can I witness to my neighbor? How can I tell my friends about Jesus Christ? You know, having friends over for meals is a great way of building relationships and uh, leading to conversations. Just to sup with someone and to recline with them. Even today, it's true in our life. How many of you invite the person you like the least to have supper with you? It usually doesn't happen, <laughs> right? It's, it's those who we, we want to fellowship with, those who we want to grow a bond. And I would say to you, if you're wondering, how do I begin evangelism in my community? Having meals with your neighbors is a great way to not only get to know your neighbors, but to let your neighbors get to know you and be exposed to what a Christian household looks like and what, what a Christian uh, understanding looks like. Levi does that, and they come. And here's the crazy thing. Jesus goes. Like, Jesus goes to this party. 
where, where there's all these tax collectors, where there's all these horrible, horrible sinners. I don't, I don't know how to, how to put that in our mind to where we would, we would grasp how shocking that is. I don't know if I could say, Jesus goes to this party where there's all the drunks, where there's all the drug addicts, where there's all the rapists and pedophiles, where there's all the homosexuals, where there's all the Democrats. I don't, I don't know how to put that in, in there to where we get it, but to, to see that whatever it is that you say, oh, Jesus could never. Yes, he could. Not only could he, he does. Praise God, he does. Jesus comes seeking the sinner. And he goes to this party. And I don't know who invited the Pharisees. I don't think anybody invited them. I think they're just following them around. And they see them and they begin to grumble. And as we read through Luke, you'll see this is what the Pharisees do. They, they talk about religion and they grumble. Man, we're, we're going to see this stark contrast between Jesus and the Pharisees. We're going to see this stark contrast between those who follow Christ and the Pharisees. And dear Christian, as we read this story, it is imperative that you ask yourself, am I, ask, am I acting more like a Pharisee? Then I am like my Savior. And I want to tell you, many of us today have gotten really good at talking about religion and grumbling. And they're grumbling. And they say, they call the disciples. They don't even go to Jesus. They call the disciples. And they say, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? I love that even though they... We're talking to his disciples. And Jesus says, hey, I, I've got the answer for you. Because Jesus is the answer. And Jesus answers them. And he says to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. You ever, aside from like the once a year checkup, how many of you uh, schedule appointments with your doctor because you're feeling really good? Well, <laughs> but there's an underlying condition. We found the exception to the rule. But most of us, most of us don't do that. You don't say, hey, I woke up this morning and I'm feeling great. So I think I better schedule an appointment with the doctor. Yeah. All right, that's, that's not the way that works. You only schedule an appointment when you know you're not feeling well. And Jesus is not here telling the Pharisees that they're well and that they're righteous. He's actually telling them that they don't realize how sick they actually are. Because the Pharisees are, are thinking they don't need what Jesus is giving. You see, they, they don't realize that Jesus is sitting with tax collectors and sinners. But they don't realize that they should be one of the sinners that he's sitting with. They're, they're quick to realize everyone else's sin and to diagnose everyone else's sin. But they don't realize their own sin. It's just like when I, when I read and I said, I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners. And we said, amen. And probably your mind and my mind went to those who we knew were sinners. Instead of to ourselves. Instead of realizing that the marvel here is not that Jesus called a tax collector. The marvel here is not that Jesus sat at a table with tax collectors and sinners. Dear friend, the marvel is Jesus called you and he called me because we are the sinner. 
And unless we recognize that, we'll never come to Him. Unless we realize that, we'll never follow after Him. You're one of two people today. You're either Levi, who realizes he's a sinner in need of a Savior and desires to follow that Savior, or you're the Pharisee, who thinks others are sinners and doesn't realize his own spiritual need. And it causes you to despise the Savior. Because he goes against everything that you think is right. Levi recognized his condition. He wasn't, he wasn't trying to hide it or deny it or, or change it. He knew what he was. And when Jesus says, follow me, he gets up, he leaves all of that, and he follows after him. Because Levi knew change needed to happen. The Pharisees are now... In their second story, they've seen Jesus forgive sins and prove he had the power to do so by raising a man who was paralyzed. And yet, even now, as they watch his actions, they just grumble. Because they still are focused on what everyone else is doing and not about their own spiritual condition. Why? Because they're the Pharisees. The very name means the set apart ones. They are the righteous. They know the law. They know the Bible. They do all the moral things. I'm telling you one reason why when we read the Bible, you and I despise the Pharisees is because we don't like people that look a lot like us. You don't believe that, just parent for a while, right? It's the child that is most like you that drives you the most crazy, the craziest. And the Pharisees remind us so much of ourselves as we read through Scripture. We line up with them way more than we would care to admit. We know the Scriptures. We know what's right or wrong. We see the evil out there. We wonder how people could tolerate those kind of things. Why won't they just do what's right? Why won't they just come to church? Why won't they just practice these things? And we grumble. No real desire to take the truth to them as much as to rejoice in the fact that we're not like them. but we are saved for Jesus Christ. We are the sinner that He has come to save. Do you realize your need of a Savior today? Do you realize your lack of righteousness? Do you think you need a doctor or just everyone else needs a doctor? The Pharisees, though, don't, don't get the hint, even with this profound statement that Jesus makes. He says, not come to call the righteous, but to, to call the sinner to repentance. And it's like that word repentance uh, hits the, their mind and they think, oh, well, let's talk about repentance. Let's talk about acts of repentance. Let's talk about the traditions of righteousness. Let's talk about what that looks like, you who are eating and drinking and feasting. Let's talk about fasting. You want to say that you're calling people to repentance. Well, that's interesting because I don't see your disciples fast ever. How, how are they repenting if they're not repenting in this traditional standard way? If they're not doing the customs that we're used to doing. And by the way, it's not just us. It's also John the Baptist. You like John. You and John are good friends. John's disciples also fast. Why aren't you fasting? You, you say that you're leading toward righteousness, but here are the things that we know are the practices of the righteous. Why aren't you doing those things? Jesus, again, always has the answer. And he says to them, can the, can the wedding guests fast when the bridegroom is with them? How many of you go to a wedding expecting that there's going to be food afterwards? 
it's the best part of the wedding, right? I mean, <laughs> but we, we go, uh, we, we suffer through the service to get to the food. But <laughs> there's, no, don't, but, uh, <laughs> sorry, that's my Baptist coming out. Um, there's a, <laughs> but we... We know that when we're at the wedding, there's going to be food. It would, it would almost be ridiculous for there not to be some kind of food that's at the wedding. We, we expect that when we go to this, that part of the celebration is the feasting. We associate feasting with celebrating. And so Levi is celebrating because he's found life. Because he's found forgiveness. Because he's with Christ. We fast because of a longing. A desire. A longing to be with the Lord. A longing to have things right. A longing for forgiveness. And so we have these contrasts here where you have a, a celebration, but you also have the longing. And we say, well, well, which one are we in today? And actually there's debate over this, but I, I think the real answer is both. We're in this time where we are, where we are feasting. Because we have Christ and He is with us and we are with Him. But we're also in this already not yet kind of time. Where we have Him, but not as we will have Him. Where we are with Him, but not as we will be with Him. Where we are forgiven, but not as we fully will be. Where we are saved, but we are being saved. And so we feast, but we also fast. But the Pharisees are, are using this fast just as a means of, of trying to trick Jesus, of trying to trap him. No one fasts all the time. Everyone eats every now and then. <laughs> Even the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees. They're, they're, they're not so much worried about Jesus eating as they're worried about who Jesus is eating with. And that's because they're not so much worried about the who as they are about their traditions. Remember when I told you that to eat with someone was to be, befriend them? Well, especially in this time, in the Pharisaic laws, you don't eat with sinners. This is the crazy thing that we've seen with Jesus already. Go back and, and read the Old Testament. And God tells us to stay away from the unholy. Why? Because staying away, because being with the unholy makes you unholy. It's this crazy thing that when you touch something that is unclean, you become unclean. But what Luke has already shown us, what the Pharisees aren't getting, what, what many of us may even be missing, is that Christ changes everything. And so we already see that when Jesus touch, touches a leper, Jesus doesn't become unclean. The leper becomes clean. Everything is changing with Jesus because he's not just a type, because he's not just a, a picture, but because he is God Almighty in flesh, come to seek out and to save the lost. He is the epitome of holiness and what he touches becomes holy. So for him to sit amongst a group of sinners, praise God, it doesn't make him a sinner. It makes the sinners clean. And we need to realize that because we need to understand that's the only way we've come to holiness. is because in His grace, in His mercy, He chose to sit with us. He chose to fellowship with us. He chose to reach out and touch us. And when He did, He made us clean. He changes everything. Jesus did not come to improve Judaism. Jesus did not come to just make the traditions a little bit better. Jesus did not come to just add a little bit to the morality that we needed to follow after. 
This is his whole point with this parable about the new and the old. The problem, the reason the Pharisees can't grasp what's happening is because they're holding on to their old tradition so hard that they can't see the fulfillment of the new. And they're trying to fit Jesus into this little box that they know. And they're saying, this is what you do. And Jesus is saying, I'm changing all of that. I'm not getting rid of morality, but I'm actually making people holy. There's a big difference between someone becoming holy and someone just acting moral. I, I'm, not, I'm not getting rid of the law. I'm fulfilling the law. I'm not shunning the sinner. I came to find the sinner. And Jesus is changing all of this. And when he changes all of it, man, it just messes with the religious people of the day. I think one reason that we get irritated at the Pharisees here is because I think it would mess with us too. We, we've, we've got a box of what it looks like to do ministry. We've got a box of what it looks like to be a conservative Christian. Check the check marks. If you check the check marks, you're in. If you go a little bit outside that check mark, especially today... Oh, craziness today. Get a little bit outside that and boy, you're just way out. In fact, there's a movement I saw on, uh, on Twitter, which you know is a great resource. Um, if, you, if you need to increase your prayer life, it's a great re resource. It's a movement, I guess it's called X today, but um, there's a movement called Christian Nationalism. I'm not going to say much about it. I'm just going to say this. There was a guy who was talking about it and said, it is not necessary that people actually be Christians to have Christian nationalism. It's just necessary that they act like Christians. And I thought to myself, aside from Christian nationalism, let me change that. Let me change it. In America today, it's not necessary that a person be a Christian to be in the church. It's just necessary that they act like a Christian. How many of us just assume that our dear brothers and sisters sitting around us are actually saved? How many times when you meet the Christian do you actually say to them, tell me about your, your conversion. Tell me about when Christ called you Tell me about your walk with Christ now. Or do you just say, well, they do all the things that I do. They're probably saved. They, they talk about Jesus every now and then, and they, they seem to live a moral life. That's got to be a Christian. What's our standard? What's our mission? Are we coming to, to hang out with the righteous, to, to confirm the righteousness of those who act like us? Are we on mission to find those who are apart from Christ and bring them to Him? Are we on mission to, to find those who don't act like us and say, hey, we know the one who can change all of that? Or are we just confirming our own little bubble? Are we on mission to say, this is what Scripture actually says? Or to say, here are our traditions. If you do these things, we think you'll be happy here. Are we seeking the lost? And I mean all the lost? Or just the lost who need a little bit of tweaking and then they could be just like us? Jesus comes seeking not those who are righteous, not those who have their own self-righteousness or are self-deceived into thinking they are righteous, but to those who know they need a Savior. 
Dear friend, before we even begin to go out and look for the lost, let me ask you this morning, do you realize you still need a Savior? Do you realize you still need forgiveness of sin? Are you holding everyone to your standard? Are, you, are everyone and yourself to the standard of Christ? What's our mission? What's our expectation? What's our understanding? And do we realize Jesus changes everything? Or are we just kind of keeping status quo? What's the goal? What's the call? What are we following? Who are we following? Are we following Jesus? Or are we following the Pharisees? May we have a desire to see the sinner come to Christ. May we have the desire to see that even ourselves are in need of the righteousness of Christ. May we seek to obey Scripture and to, to follow after Christ more than we seek to follow the traditions of man. May we understand the glory of the new covenant and not be longing for the old with just a little bit of Jesus added into it. To the glory of his name, may it be so. Let us pray. God, as we come, we come confessing to you that oftentimes we find ourselves just like the Pharisees. Father, we're more likely to see a group and, and recognize why we despise them and wouldn't want to be around them than we are to see a group and, and recognize their need for a Savior and to be the one to take the gospel to them. In fact, Father, many of us probably suffer with realizing that to, to go to that group would, would mean that those like myself would probably cast judgment upon them. Why are they hanging out with those people? Father, help us to realize that we are those people. That apart from you, there is nothing good in us. That apart from you, we are just wretched sinners. But because of your grace, because of your mercy, because of your love, because you came seeking us, you have made us righteous. So, Father, now in your grace, in your mercy, in your love, because you seek to save the lost, may we go to the lost. May we not get caught up in all of our traditions, but may we go proclaiming the power of the gospel. May we not preach just morality, but may we preach salvation. We ask these things in your name. Amen.